Welcome to another broadcast of the Dr. Briar Lee Mitchell Show on the Artist First Radio Network. Dr. Briar Lee Mitchell is the author of Big Ass Shock and Walking on Mars. Her books and bio can be found at briarmitchell.com. Dr. Mitchell is also a nationally certified rescue volunteer, helping law enforcement find missing people with her canine partner, Thor. And folks, she can paint. Check out her paintings on the website. And now here she is. It's Dr. Briarly Mitchell. Thank you, Scott. What a wonderful intro. And to all the listeners tuning in tonight, so delighted that you're here on a beautiful Tuesday evening. Uh, I have a really wonderful guest tonight, and I'm so delighted that this author has uh, made the choice to join us. I think this will be a, a very fun show. My guest tonight is Pam, Pam Ferdebar. Am I pronouncing it right, Ferdebar? You are. You win a prize for that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Pam, how are you doing tonight? I am very well, thank you. It is a beautiful, beautiful night. I'm so glad that it's summer, and it's yes. great to be here. Well, I'm so glad that you are on the show this evening. I'm really looking forward to talking about this book of yours. It just looks like wacky fun, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing about from you about how you came up with the idea, and um, the name of the book that we're talking about is Feng Shui and Charlotte Mart- Night- Nightingale, and it just is a really wacky fun concept for a book, and the title is hysterical. For, for those of you turning in, tuning in tonight, and if you want to look at the website while Pam and I chat, it's at www.pamferdebar.com, and it has a wonderful photo of Pam. I love that shirt, by the way. It looks like a tuxedo shirt. Oh, thank you. It is sort of. Is it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love that with jeans. It's like my uniform. Oh, I think it's fabulous. I think it's a great look on you. So, Pam, can you talk to us a little bit? Tell us a little bit about yourself first. Oh, boy. I I grew up in Wisconsin um, in a family advertising photography business. And then um, when I got out of college, I thought it would be neat to get into video and started doing television commercials. And then in 1994 decided how hard could it be to go from that to making movies. Then I moved to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Um, That's when my Charlotte moments started. (laughs) We'll talk Mm -hmm. about Charlotte moments later. But I was there for 20 years. And actually, um, it was lovely. It was really, really lovely. And uh, two years ago, I decided to come back to Wisconsin. My uh, folks are in their 80s. They're in awesome shape, but I'm an only child, and we get along really well, and I just wanted to be able to spend time with them. Mm-hmm. Well, I can relate to that. I lived in L.A. for 23 years, and oh. three years ago I moved to Florida. My parents live here, and I wanted to be closer to them. In fact, I'm at their house tonight doing the show, and, uh, yeah, they're in their 80s. My dad is. and uh, so Friday I, I met my parents. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think Where we might have been you? separated at birth, except with different parents. <laughs> Korea, we're at our parents' house. I'm in the guest bedroom. <laughs> I'm in my old bedroom. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> it's all wonderful. Well, I in Los Angeles, I, I worked in the industry for for a number of years. Uh, I wasn't doing production work. I was a, an artist working in animated film and making games. So I want to hear more about what you were doing there. Well, I started out directing television commercials and thought that that would be such an easy, you know, the next step into directing motion pictures. And that didn't pan out. And I thought, well, I, I have a degree in journalism, and I always, always, always wanted to be a writer, and why not do what you love? and started writing, and um, I wrote a bunch of screenplays, couldn't get an agent, you know, I mean, kind of the classic story, and then I wrote a short story called Feng Shui and Charlotte Nightingale, and started giving copies of it to my friends, and I said, look, if you know anyone in the book world or in the film business, assuming you like this little story, um, would you mind passing this on? And the next thing I knew, Madonna wanted to option the property for her production (laughs) company. 
And that set in motion um, a bidding war over the film rights, and for which we set a record. <laughs> and, and then they hired me to write the screenplay, and it was right in the middle of adapting the screenplay when all of my executives at New Line got fired in the Time Warner merger. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, you know, you're up, you're down, you're up, you're down. Mm-hmm. And then I went back to advertising and um, was just kind of frustrated that nothing, you know, that it got shelved, basically. And then two years ago, when I was thinking about moving back to Wisconsin, I thought, mm, you know, uh, why not? They paid a lot, a lot, a lot of money for the film rights. It's kind of a cool idea. Maybe I should turn it into an actual book. And I did. And then I, I moved back here. And as I was unpacking and going through my things, I said, oh, yeah, there's that manuscript. And just lightning kind of struck again. I found a publisher pretty quickly. And it's a small independent publisher, which I love because you get a lot of personal attention. And they really seem to care about the project. And and here we are. It, it was released last Sunday, June 21st, and things are going well. <laughs> so that's the story in a nutshell. What did you do I, in, when you were in Los Angeles? You were doing um, animation, right, games and stuff? I wonder if our paths crossed. They could have because I was part of the Time Warner you know, merger, and I left Warner Brothers at that time and went over to Universal for a while, and then I... Uh, went to work for the Art Institute, which is what I do now. I teach there and have mm. for the last 13 years. And now I live on a little farm in mid-Florida and and uh, can actually see the stars at night. <laughs> well, it sounds lovely. If you, can you see the Big Dipper right now? Because I'm in Wisconsin. <laughs> you can see the stars. You can see the stars again. Yeah, well, I, yeah. I love the title of your book, and I'm so pleased that it's out, and I'm so excited for you because Thank I read you. through this uh, synopsis that you'd sent to me, and I was just so uh, – I was laughing over that. It just seemed like such a fun and wacky sort of situation, and I'm thinking, wow, this has to have had some real moments in your life, and you, you call them, in fact, Charlotte moments. And, I mean, is there a good example that you can give us that inspired some of the things that happened to your Charlotte? Uh, Char- Charlotte's moments or my moments? That your is- moments. Your moments oh, that Lord. may have inspired Charlotte's. Oh, to narrow it down, let's see. Well, it's... <laughs> Started very, very young. Um, my dad's mom was a seamstress, and we were quite poor when I was little. Plus, I was the only grandchild for a long time, so my grandma wanted to make all my clothes. And when I was about 10 years old, I was rather corpulent, and I and I was on a swim swim team, if you can picture this little butterball cutting through the the water and I wanted a two-piece bathing suit in the worst way and my parents God love them because clearly they saw me for who I was said oh no you're too young for a (laughs) two-piece they were just trying to spare me but my grandma didn't think I was chunky and she said honey I'll make you a bathing suit and we went and we got a pattern at the at the at the fabric store and picked out this beautiful white waffle weave with these yellow applique daisies <laughs> and she made me my two piece and I had a swim meet and you didn't have to wear like a speedo or regulation stuff. It wasn't like a real, you know, it was like an inner city kind of swim meet kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And um you get in the water, you get used to the water, then you get out, you know, and, and you dive in and and I realized that, oh, my butt feels really weird. And I kind of looked behind me, and there were my bottoms at the other end of the pool. <laughs> and Grandma, Grandma didn't know there was something called swimsuit elastic. <laughs> so she just put regular elastic in, and it got loose enough when I went in to get used to the water that when I got out and then dove in, they were way on the I'm sure it was like an albino manatee, kind of just with that but bobbing toward the other end. <laughs> and then no one would bring them to me. It was horrifying. I kind of like oh, hop, oh. swam, hop, swam to the other side. And, you know, oh. but I, I realized that day because my dad in the car was trying not to laugh. And I thought, you know what? This is funny. Even at the time, I kind of realized that and thought um, that will save me some days. The ability to laugh at myself. Before other people start laughing, mm-hmm. 
<laughs> it's a lightsaber. So there have been, there's just myriad Charlotte moments like that in my life. Yeah. That's why when people say, oh, this, you know, some people say the book is a little bit over the top or these things are so implausible. They're not. <laughs> They're really not. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got the proof of this. <laughs> you should have kept a swimsuit and framed it and put it above the mantle. Oh, we need a big mantle, Briar. Big, big mantle. <laughs> well, I adore the cover for your book. Did you come up with the idea for the cover? I actually worked with a dear, dear friend who used to be a client of ours when we had the photo studio. Mm-hmm. She's a wonderful graphic designer. And um, I just, just, she had read the book, and I described sort of a general concept of, you know, no, she came up with the idea for the legs. And the mo- and I, I photographed it, actually, and the model showed up with that pink Band-Aid on her knee. She was running late for the shoot um, and hadn't shaved and then realized, oh, crap, it's a leg shoot, you know, so ran in the house and decided to dry shave oh. at a moment. Charlotte moment, right? Mm-hmm. And cut her knee. And when she came in and we gave her the funny socks and the shoes and all that, she was going to pull the Band-Aid off. And Deb Tyska, who is the, the cover designer, said, oh, no. She said, leave that on. It's so <laughs> perfect. It so now when I do events and stuff, I have boxes of pink Band-Aids. <laughs> oh, how funny. Oh, that's wonderful. It's a fun picture. I mean, the gnarly chunky socks with the very delicate <laughs> shoes is just quite a sight and i hope that my listeners here you should tune in and, and look at um pam's website is it it should also be listed on amazon now where where would people be able to find your book along with your oh, website amazon.com uh barnesandnoble.com henschelhousebooks.com h-e-n-s-c-h-e-l-h-a-u-s B O O K S dot com, mm-hmm. um, and hopefully soon in Barnes and Noble, and then in a lot of independent bookstores. That's so cool. That's call terrific. and ask. That's terrific, and it's really a delightful cover. And please, folks, tune in. Look, tune into the. I say tune in all the time. I should say navigate to <laughs> <laughs> Amazon dot com or the other sites or to Pam website because the, the cover is there very clearly shown and it's delightful now the chinese characters are those is that say feng shui it does well it's those are the the characters for wind and water and feng shui okay. literally translates to wind and water got it and you mentioned that in the synopsis about the book which is really a very fun read so i i do hope that people will read this because it really is a fun delightful <laughs> book and the charlotte moments we've all had charlotte moments i think most of us the snootier people in life like to pretend that they never happened but oh my gosh we all have had charlotte moments <laughs> Oh, come on. I mean, they don't sweat either, right? I mean, who hasn't had? Mm -hmm. I think, like, the the quintessential, the description of the Charlotte moment is that that thing that happens to you, and you absolutely have to reach for the phone and call your mom, your sister, your best friend, you know, whomever it is, and say, you are not going to believe the thing that just happened to me. (laughs) And it's that thing. That thing has a name now. <laughs> it's the Charlotte yeah. moment. And I actually, um, with Deb Tyska, because I'm also a photographer and she also does illustrations, want to do a companion book because Charlotte is going to be a series. And I want to do a companion book of people's Charlotte moment mm-hmm. with augmented by photography and, and with illustration. So... I'm asking people if they have good Charlotte stories, you can tweet them or Instagram them with that hashtag Charlotte moment or email me at Pam at Pam com. Mm-hmm. And um, I am happy to, and there's like a little contest actually, the, the most, the, the Charlottiest one <laughs> each month <laughs> will win a little feng shui swag. Oh, that's hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> that's a tongue twister but, uh-huh. um, <laughs> so it's and I've gotten such funny funny stories and again they're they're funny <laughs> in that pathetic way <laughs> but 
if you don't laugh at stuff, I mean, you know, what's the point? You'd just be crying all the time. Well, it's true, and I, I think that for many of us, when we have those Charlotte moments, when they hit out of the blue, uh, you're like, oh, what did I do? What did I do yeah. to cause this to happen? And that's just life, and it's just these things will happen to you. But in hindsight, and it's true, some of the things that happened to me when I was growing up or in any any phase of my life, actually, when things like this happen, I kind of look back, hindsight and start laughing thinking oh my God. <laughs> did that happen how did that happen to me and how did I you know attain my my graceful <laughs> presence you know to not just continue to be a boob and continue to do these things but they happen and you learn from them and grow from them and and you've capitalized on it big time in that you've taken some of these moments from your life and used them to inspire what has happened to your character, Charlotte, in your book, which I think is delightful because then we can all laugh at some of these <laughs> moments. And are there any moments in Charlotte's life that are actually from yours? Um, well, kind of to an extent. Mm -hmm. All of them. Well, no, I shouldn't say that. Not all of them. Because some very, very odd things that don't happen to people generally <laughs> happen to Charlotte. Mm -hmm. But um, I've had just over-the-top weird things happen in my whole life. I've had friends and even family members who've said, ah, you know, you're such an exaggerator. You're like the clan of the exaggerators. And then <laughs> five minutes later... Something weird, like a piece will fall off of a satellite and clunk me on the head. And they're like, wow, weird, you know, SH, whatever, really does happen mm -hmm. to you. Like, yes, this is what I've been saying. I don't have to exaggerate. I, don't. I live it. My life's an exaggeration. <laughs> yeah, well, weird stuff happens. But in, in Charlotte's case, rather than trying to cram, you know, however many decades of funky luck <laughs> to this poor mm -hmm. character um she from the minute she wakes up in the morning until she puts her head down at night she has end to end charlotte moment mm. and now the question is is that because her feng shui her house is in disarray mm -hmm. therefore her life is in disarray or does she create the disarray because she lacks confidence? I mean, it, it does ask, it, as goofy as it is and quirky and, and fun, I think, um, it does ask some kind of sober question. You know, mm -hmm. is it with the glass half full, glass half empty kind of thing? Now, are you going to continue to pitch this as a potential movie? Well, New Line purchased, they own the movie rights, mm -hmm. and then they just, it got thrown into turnaround, which means, you know, it's just shelved. Yeah. But, what I'm hoping is that the book will do well. I mean, so f I, you know, knock wood, people seem to really, really be liking it. And I think that, you know, that was many years ago. There's a, a whole new crop of producers and whatnot at New Line, and I think they'll probably want to revisit it and say, well, hell, we already own this. <laughs> <laughs> Why wouldn't we make it a movie? We'd have to be stupid not to, oh, oh did I say that out loud? <laughs> It's, it's it would be in our best interest to make it a movie. Archive now. <laughs> <laughs> Holy all cow. eternity. All eternity. Just a ventriloquist ran in the room. And <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, you know, right? anything could happen, right? <laughs> well, and it would be fun to see how this book does, because it just really, as you said, came out, what, about two weeks ago? Yeah, yeah. Last, yeah. last Sunday, actually, the 21st. And you've been very busy. You're promoting it, and you're talking about possibly doing a sequel to this, which I think is great to be thinking about that. I think as a writer, if you dwell too much on, oh, the marketing, the marketing, uh, and don't write anymore, then you, you're, you're sort of sinking your own ship. So I'm glad to hear that you're contemplating moving on to do another or a sequel, or at least another short story, I hope, for, for this particular project. Do you have other stories in mind that you're, you're working on now or considering writing? I do. I, I started, uh, thank you for asking, that's very nice. I started mm -hmm. a novel several years ago before I wrote Charlotte as a full-length novel. Mm -hmm. um, it's called Moe's Indian, and it's quite different. I mean, it's, it's 
humorous, but it's not bust a gut, laugh out loud funny. Mm-hmm. It's more, um, oh, I hate to say literary, but it's, it's just, it's a complete, the tone is completely different. It's not like a whiz bang, you know, side splitting confection of a book. It's, it's a little bit more serious. So, um, but that may take some, you know, that's probably five, six hundred pages. Mm-hmm. So, did you ever see the movie Wonder Boys? Jeremy <laughs> Yes. Michael Douglas with his book. And yeah. his, oh, yes. And it's 4,000 pages long. Yes. <laughs> a never-ending story. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh, and then she could do this. It's like in real time I'm almost writing it, you know. <laughs> She's 24 now. But, um, yeah, so, but I'm I'm excited for the next, I actually have kind of a cool, I think, idea for the next, Charlotte book and actually one after that. So, um, you know, I'm starting to feel energized about writing again because mm-hmm. once the, I keep saying the writing is the easy part when you're a first time author, mm-hmm. regardless of whether it's an independent publisher or a gigantic house, they, they really don't do much for you in terms of marketing and promotion. You're, mm-hmm. you, if you really want to get stuff done, you kind of have to do it yourself. Mm-hmm. And it's a full time job. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I'm up at four in the morning and finish up usually around 11 o'clock at night. So it. you want to make this happen. You want to make it happen. I hope that this, I do. I truly hope that this works out the way that you want it to and that, uh, you know, your Charlotte moments here are all for the good and, uh, they're Thank all you. for Charlotte's uh, life. <laughs> Shared moments. <laughs> oh, we got contest winners. I'm looking. I'm poking around your website while we're chatting. Oh, that's a delightful photograph on your contest winners page. It's a shoe, a high heel shoe with a broken heel. Oh, with the snapped off <laughs> heel, right? <laughs> I've been at places where my shoe heel came off, and you have to just pretend that it's there. It's like the invisible heel. <laughs> Well, I know the other day I was, I went, I had some, oh, I had a, I had a little TV appearance in the morning Mm -hmm. and there was a Charlotte moment. I mean, it was, Mm -hmm. I was so nervous, but the, the, the two hosts of the show, two women were absolutely lovely, made me feel completely comfortable. I mean, my armpits were on fire, which is what happens when I get like really uncomfortable and nervous. (laughs) And, um, you know, we finished the interview, whatever, I walked off, and they said, oh, kind of a a strange thing happened. We, they interrupted the program um, Mm -hmm. to announce that um, the Supreme Court had uh, confirmed that Obamacare was constitutional. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So I was in the middle of a sentence when it went, you know, cut to breaking news. (laughs) So that was, (laughs) but, Again, on the lucky side of things, they restarted the interview after that and then played mm-hmm. the thing the whole way through. But so I was wearing high heels, and afterwards I took my dad to the pharmacy, and as we were walking out, they had one of those, like, great things in front oh, of yes. Wisconsin, and, and my heel caught, mm-hmm. and it stuck. But, of course, my foot slipped out, and I lurched forward, and I was just able to catch myself on a cart that was out there. But, of course, I, it started rolling away from me. I mean, it just... <laughs> I'm sure I looked like Grace, absolute Grace, <laughs> ailing the dress was flying up. <laughs> oh, no. Well, uh, for my listeners tonight, we're going to take a short break and do a little quick station identification. And, uh, again, please come back to listen to the second half of the show with my very enchanting guest, Pam Furterbar, who's talking about her book, <laughs> George Thorgood of the Destroyers, and you're listening to Artist First Radio. This is Arthur D. Schwartz, the host of Philosophic Perspectives, a new show on Artist First World Radio. Philosophic Perspectives is a creative journey that explores the wisdom of philosophy. 
as it applies to issues both great and personal, from social controversies to the struggles of everyday living. Join us on the first and third Wednesday of each month, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific Time. I look forward to seeing you on the radio. Peace. This is Nalo Venge. Please join me every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific on the Nalo Venge Show. Keep rocking. Remember, never give up on your dreams. Is life treating you bad? Do you find it hard figuring out how to make the right decision? Are you tired of just surviving and not thriving? If this is you, tune into the broadcast, Words of Wisdom, with me, Fountain Hendricks, every Monday at 11 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 p.m. Central Time. Learn how to live life on an incline. God has everything we need, but we need to position ourselves to receive what he has. Tune in to Words of Wisdom with me, your host, Fountain Hendricks, 11 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 p.m. Central Time. Don't meet me there. Beat me there. You are listening to the Dr. Briar Lee Mitchell Show on the Artist First Radio Network. All past broadcasts are archived. Visit artistfirst.com. And now back to your host, Dr. Briar Lee Mitchell. Scott, thank you so much for that. And again, my guest tonight is Pam Furterbar, and we're talking about Pam's book called Feng Shui and Charlotte Nightingale, which is a delightful, humorous story. And uh, we're going to be fortunate enough this next half of an hour here that at some point Pam is going to be able to read from us. But I'd like to hear more, Pam, about some of the moments that you were talking about that inspired your Charlotte to have the things happen to her in her life and some of the other things that you're doing with your book right now that just released on June 21st. And, people, you can find this at, at Amazon. So can you talk to us a little more about your book? Sure. Uh, <laughs> um, let's see. What can I tell you about the book? It, um, it's a fast read. It's, it, it, it's hilariously funny. At least people tell me that it is. It's got a little bit of an edge to it. Um, I have been, oh, my gosh, I've been trying to organize as many readings and signings and contests and doing things on social media, Mm -hmm. um, absolutely everything I can possibly think of to market the book. Um, Well, you're also doing something with book clubs. Oh, yes, I am. Uh, There are great discounts, actually. There's a tab on the website for book clubs. Mm -hmm. I would be, um, I mean, I will provide uh, sample questions, I guess, things to things, topics to consider at book clubs. Mm-hmm. Um, I would be happy to, w- when possible, like do a Skype thing, or if it's within a 50-mile radius of wherever I am, mm-hmm. I will come and darken your book club. With my <laughs> <laughs> All I require is a little bit of red wine. <laughs> uh. um, but I think it's a really, really, really fun book for book clubs because what has happened, at least what used to happen with me, when I would read chapters to my girlfriends or, or you know, run ideas past them, is it's, it's human nature. You cannot help but want to share your own quirky moments, the Charlotte moments, you know, the mm-hmm. ill-fated things that have happened to you. And the next thing you know, everybody is laughing. And it kind of, I think it's a way to combat the, the negative <laughs> Mm-hmm. connotations of, of things that, that you know, really bad things that happen, you can somehow spin them and make them funny sometimes. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, it's a great talent to do that. I know some people who perennially walk around with that you know rain cloud over their heads, and and don't find the humor. And it's hard sometimes. And I, I granted that it can be hard, but the more that you can look back on some of these things and laugh at them and realize that you're still moving forward and you're still able to enjoy the sunshine. You also on your site, I'm seeing you have a wonderful blog page, and you have an ability here, a nice content page so people the readers for your book and you know definitely contact Pam she's really easy to talk to (laughs) yeah I mean tell me your own funny stories ask any questions Um, that to me is the coolest thing about like the internet and social media and all that is that you get to actually have a conversation and dialogue with readers Mm -hmm. that you know in the in the past I guess you you know you might sign a book here and there and, and, and write things that would that would get published in, in interviews or what have you. But now you can actually have a dialogue back and forth with people in other parts of the world. So I don't know. I just love it, love it, love it. Because the more questions I ask, the more informed my writing becomes. And I want characters to be relatable. And I'm, it, 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 that's another thing that I, I do hear from people is that, oh, that Charlotte is me. Yeah. <laughs> Assuming you're an, you're honest with yourself, you know, and you kind of can see your foibles for what they are, but also know that underneath it, you're a good person and you're strong. Then yeah, people should keep Charlotte. I think that's a very important point, you know, the ability to be honest with yourself. And I think that's where humor, being able to laugh at the things in our life that normally people would complain about, is part of that. Well, and I think in a sense you create your own luck and I, that's kind of another a question I, I hope that people think about after they've read the book is if you believe in something like the power of feng shui or prayer voodoo magic what, whatever it is you know whatever your belief system is mm-hmm. and you invest yourself in that and something changes in your life is it because of the feng shui prayer voodoo magic you know what have you or is it because you had a goal in mind when you embarked on that thing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so you just, because you're more focused on it, did, did you make that happen yourself? Or maybe is it a combination of all the above, or is it just random? I mean, I certainly don't know the answer to that, but I know for myself personally, when I force myself to be more upbeat, you know when they mm-hmm. say that you actually release a... Um, a pheromone when you smile, all these different muscles fire off, and it literally makes your brain feel happier. So I think there's like a little, well, seriously, there's a little mind over matter thing. If you kind of, uh-huh. you know, plaster a smile on your face and throw your shoulders back, hmm, I don't know why. Today I was a little luckier than I was yesterday when I was, you know, with the long face, ooh, bitching everybody. So. Mm-hmm. I think that's a very good point. You know, it's, you know, most of this is in the way we perceive the world around us and where we fit into it. Now, you are going to read some of your book for us tonight, yes? I would love to. Now, do you need to set any of this up before you start? I do. Let me just grab my little note here. Um, well, firstly, uh, you should know that Charlotte is the poster child for bad feng shui. <laughs> everything about, I mean, it, it from her, up, everything in her apartment, the architecture, the clutter, everything. She's just a mess. Um, she has a perfect, very lucky, blonde, younger sister named Charlene. She has an incredibly judgmental mother. And she's got a real louse of a boyfriend who, in quotes, borrows her rent money, whatever he can find it. Mm-hmm. Um, so the story picks up. She's just arriving back at home after a very, very, uh, naturally, bad day at work. And she has the worst job in the world, of course. <laughs> so this is Charlotte arriving home. Okay. Okay. Grocery bags stuffed with newspapers and magazines that she never quite got around to recycling lined the walls of the narrow space that led into her apartment. Behind the bags, covered in an inch of dust, an old mirror was propped against the wall, another project Charlotte meant to undertake if and when she could remember to buy a hammer and nails. 
The plant Joey had tripped over on his way out had finally expired and dropped a little pile of dried leaves around it. She tossed her keys onto a credenza cluttered with trinkets, mementos, and junk, then tripped over the dead plant and subsequently kicked it and the still dirt to the side. As if she were headed to the dentist's chair for an unanesthetized root canal, Charlotte shuffled in on feet made of lead. It was the same every day. Exhausted, she dropped into a chair to regroup. She knew she should bring some order into the place, but the notion only depressed her. Where to start? It was overwhelming, like taking the first steps in a million-mile journey or having a gallon of caramel biscuit and cream haagen in the freezer and 30 pounds to lose by the weekend. <laughs> she stared out one of the room's only windows, hypnotized by a flashing neon sign over a seedy bar across the street. Open. 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 When the end suddenly went dark, she dropped her bag onto the sofa and sat down. Next to the couch on a side table strewn with magazines, books, and some broken pottery, Charlotte meant to fix one day, the telephone answering machine also flashed hypnotically. She blinked in unison with the machine until the phone rang and startled her out of her trance. She picked up the phone. Hello? She said tentatively. Perhaps she had only dreamed the phone was ringing. Hello, Mother. She groaned upon hearing the caller's voice, disappointed that it hadn't been a dream. No, I just got in. I was just going to listen to my messages. Well, then, I don't have to repeat myself, said Charlotte's mother, a lilting southern accent, giving everything she uttered a sweetly acrid flavor, like honey on burning rubber. (laughs) Dad said to remind you to bring a date, but if you plan on bringing that impasta... It would be best if you came alone. Impersonator, Mom. He's a Frank Sinatra. Ignoring Charlotte, Mother continued. And, of course, I would understand completely if you didn't want to come at all. Charlotte could hear her dad in the background, but what he was saying was unclear. Her mother resumed, sighing a long, suffering sigh. (sighs) Just wear something terrific. Your father wants you to come. Dr. Belmont will be there. Please look nice. Her mother said nice, the way a serial killer might say fava beans and Chianti, <laughs> sending a shiver down Charlotte's spine. Click, mother hung up. Charlotte pressed the play button on her answering machine, walked into the kitchen, and opened the refrigerator to retrieve a small parcel wrapped in white paper. Meanwhile, the machine informed her that there were six new messages. The first, a jarring missive from her landlord, detailed his resentment that the water cascading over the balcony every morning had drowned his cactuses. I prefer cacti, Charlotte muttered while turning on the oven. She yanked a chipped cornware casserole off a shelf, banged it on the counter next to the sink, and unwrapped the white parcel. As Charlotte was nearly KO'd by the stench of rotten fish, the machine played its next message. Charlotte was seized by the gag reflex as her mother disclosed that the younger sibling had finally been asked to marry a certain Dr. Belmont. Charlotte used the slimy butcher paper to stuff the odious seafood into the garbage disposal. On the machine, while her mother chirped with the news that Dr. Belmont was a plastic surgeon in Beverly Hills, no less, Charlotte flipped the switch for the disposal and turned on the tap. Water dripped out in such pathetic droplets that it did nothing to prevent the most most pieces of putrid haddock from flying out of the drain and sticking to everything against against which it splat. (laughs) Mrs. Mrs. Nightingale wrapped up her message by telling Charlotte that the ring given the younger Nightingale girl was a rock the size of New Hampshire. Actually, it was a rock the size of New Hampshire flanked by two equally gigantic states along the eastern seaboard cut in sizzling baguette configurations. (laughs) And could Charlotte please wear something nice to dinner on Friday? With globs of spoiled seafood stuck to her hair and clothes, Charlotte was tempted to stick her hand in the incinerator just so she could go to the hospital where they might give her something for the pain. (laughs) However, realizing the folly of this line of thinking given her slim chance of making any plan work, she turned off the grinding apparatus. 
The answering machine warned her of another message. And although she sensed any further messages were likely to be equally upsetting, she was powerless to move. Just like in the recurring dream Charlotte had, in which someone driving a dusty Arizona beige Mercury Villager with a golf ball-sized dent under the passenger side rearview mirror, suspiciously similar to the family minivan of her childhood, was trying to run her down in the street, and if she could only get one foot in the curb, she'd be safe, but her shoes had suddenly become made of concrete. Charlotte stood before the sink as Joey told her the answer, as Joey told her answering machine that he would be called out of town for a few days and would have to replay the, repay the clams he borrowed upon his return. Charlotte became aware that her mouth was open in the silent scream that accompanied the minivan nightmare. She snapped her jaw shut. At that point, the answering machine went haywire and once again informed Charlotte she had six new messages. And then it repeated the second message, her mother's triumphant bulletin concerning the impending nuptials between Charlotte and the Beverly Hills doctor. Charlotte touched the oven. It was cold. She wished half-heartedly that the gas company had not cut off her service. It looked kind of comfortable inside, a place for quiet reflection away from mother's giddy news flash. Charlotte kicked the stove and stomped into the living room where she stabbed at the buttons of the answering machine to no avail. As she ripped the electrical cord from the socket, the machine droned out the words, Dr. Belmont will be there. (laughs) And let me tell you, at that little dinner, all hell breaks loose. (laughs) Poor Charlotte. Oh, my God. She had fish stuck in her hair. Ooh, ooh. I know. Can you imagine? Oh, gosh. I just, ooh. (laughs) The smell of that stuff. I mean, and I think it's so much fun that her boyfriend is a Frank Sinatra impersonator. (laughs) Where did that come from? I don't, well, you know, I grew up with Frank Sinatra because my folks are crazy about him. And there's something, he just, he was so sexy, but he just seemed like such a little shit, you know? So, mm-hmm. I don't know. And Joey is just, um, he's, he's, he's a bad boy. He's a very, very sexy bad boy. Well, he wants to be a bad boy, but I mean, for God's sake, he's a Frank Sinatra impersonator. Mm-hmm. No, so, now, you have yeah. a trailer that's on your website, and it's a... Uh, uh, it's actually Charlotte's younger sister going on and on, showing off her ring and talking about yeah. her her poor sister. And I think the, the trailer is a lot of fun. Now, did you produce the trailer? I did. I shot it. Because, <laughs> you know, you used to do TV commercials. So, um, yeah, and I didn't want to do the, the kind of traditional um, in a world, you know, and you have mm-hmm. all the graphics and all that. I just think that seeing Charlotte through someone else's eyes, particularly someone as self-centered and um, misguided as her sister, would be perfect. And, again, at that, you know, and it's I don't know if you saw it at at the end, but Charlotte's at the doorbell Mm -hmm. and um, looks quite different from what you might imagine because on this particular day, this is conceivably the worst day of her life, she... This slurry of events happened, and she ends up purchasing a dress and shoes that in a gajillion years she never, never, never would have bought. But she, through these weird circumstances, ends up in this dress and heels, and it's so uncomfortable and awkward in it. But, of course, looks like a million bucks, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and no one sees that coming. (laughs) <laughs> oh. And the the dress that the sister's wearing is hysterical. It's a <laughs> fine <the> <laughs> green cacophony of just, you know, miles and miles of fabric in this dress covered with gigantic <laughs> roses. <I know. laughs> oh, yeah. it's like and she's around. so evil. I mean, she's just <laughs> the coolest. She just, these characters are so real to me. I I really feel like they have, you know, flesh and blood. Because she's, um, you know, I, I love her because mm-hmm. she doesn't, she's not really malevolent. She's she's just kind of clueless. 
You know, she's so, because her whole life, from the day she was born, she was the golden girl. Mm. And everyone just thought she was so perfect, and she's never had to work for anything, and every, you know. And again, that begs the question, is she lucky, or is it just that everybody built her up her whole life till she started believing her own PR and mm. made her own luck? You know, nothing bad has ever happened to her. Well, I also enjoy on your website that you let the readers have the entire first chapter to read through, and I think that's a lot of fun that they can get into your writing. Now, when you start writing or when you're getting ready to, you know, go through the book and and write some more on it, um, do you prepare, like, uh, an outline? Do you just let the characters speak to you? How do you go through a chapter? The... So this when it, this the outline I guess was the short story and it it, mm-hmm. um, it wrote itself which has never happened before it it was uh, I saw a thing on television on the news one night about feng shui and I'd never heard those words before you know this is many years ago over ten years ago and mm-hmm. this this piece was about how huge corporations Sony Disney Kaiser Permanente you know were hiring these feng shui practitioners. Uh, to work with architects on new projects that they were building, but then also to have people come in and sort of feng shui, in quotes, their existing spaces. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I started doing research, and I thought, what an interesting concept. Because, you know, you you walk into a place sometimes, and you're automatically comfortable. It's like Mm -hmm. a a good vibe. Well, this place Mm -hmm. probably has all its feng shui ducks in a row. (laughs) So... I, right? I mean, it's, and ducks are a big thing, feng shui. But mm-hmm. um, I started to think, what if, because I like to ask that question a lot, and usually it's something absurd, and this sort of was it. What if you decided to, like, do feng shui for somebody else, and they didn't know you were doing it? You know, like, what, what would happen? <laughs> and that's what happens in this story. The the Chinese food delivery man, Kwan, mm-hmm. um, is a feng shui practitioner on the side, And he brings Charlotte food, and he's so horrified by what he sees. And he Mm -hmm. he, and 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 there's no question in his mind why every day is an absolute crap day for her. It's because her place is the it's full of char chi, you know, the poison arrows of bad luck. (laughs) And so he starts bringing her food that she didn't even order. Mm -hmm. Um, And what's so and she's so beat down by life that she uh, resigned to it. She goes and she starts looking for the money to pay him. She's there's no fight left in her. And while she's in her closet excavating pockets and old handbags, he starts moving little things around in her apartment (laughs) to to improve her life. So that's that came from that what if thing. And then I woke Mm -hmm. up at three o'clock in the morning one day, and I, I kid you not, it it felt literally. Like this little character was on my shoulder and mm-hmm. just said, write, 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 and I'm going to tell you what to write. I'm going to say it right in your ear. And six days later, it was done. And, of course, wow. you know, I spent a few months editing it, but the story just, it just poured out. I have no idea where it came from, somewhere in my subconscious, because I was really unhappy at that time. Mm-hmm. So I think my, it was my brain's way of trying to trick me into being happy. <laughs> So when you came back to Minnesota to your parents' house, did you feng shui the Minnesota house? <laughs> Wisconsin, Wisconsin. Oh, Wisconsin. Um, sorry, <laughs> we are the we are the feng shui state. No, no, wait, that's the dairy state. I'm sorry. Um, we, <laughs> um, kind of, kind of. I'm a I'm a neat nick, and I can't stand clutter. And my mom likes to, she likes her collections of things. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> it doesn't matter what I say. You know, this is bad luck. She's like, ah, I'm 88 <laughs> years old. <laughs> I'd say I've had pretty good luck. You know, yeah, I had to laugh point. about the, the character, Quan who comes in and starts moving things around. When I was living in Los Angeles for a short time, I had belonged to a book club. And I was at the host's house one night. And I thought this thing on her mantle looked out of place, and I was going to put it in a better place. And I went to pick it up, <laughs> but it was glued down with that earthquake wax. You know, oh, stuff. right. <laughs> I couldn't move it. And I went, oh, maybe I should think about somewhere else to live where you don't have to glue everything down in your house. <laughs> I'd forgotten about that. And, and, and like, uh, armoires and things, you have to drill them into the wall. Remember the earthquake, earthquake oh, straps? Yes. 
Yes. Oh, I had them everywhere in the house, on the tall uh, furniture and then the yeah. the uh, water heater. And, I mean, I went through a couple of big quakes, and I'm sure you did because we were there about the same time. But, wow, yep. that was so funny. I thought, oh, I'll do her a favor. <laughs> I couldn't do her a favor. That's hilarious. <laughs> it was glued down. <laughs> with that earthquake wax, and it was like, I thought at first I was Give like, yourself a hernia it. trying to move it. <laughs> I'm looking around for the hidden camera, you know, what? <laughs> I was set oh up my here. God. Well, I, you know, and coming from Wisconsin, you know, mm-hmm. with earthquakes, what the heck is that? I had just moved to L.A. when we had the Northridge quake. Mm. And I was renting a duplex, the downstairs near the Beverly Center. Oh. And um, it, the fireplace fell into the living room. Every window broke. All the wooden yeah. floors splintered and popped up. Mm-hmm. And I had, like, glass and wood in my feet for days because I didn't know about the whole keep the shoes next to the bed thing. And we had tremendous aftershock. So I started sleeping with like a motorcycle jacket, boots and gloves on. (laughs) And a week to the day after the earthquake, I had to go to Pittsburgh for HBO. I was shooting the behind the scenes of a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie called Mm -hmm. Sudden Death. Oh, yes. And so I was in this trailer. Um, Powers Booth played the bad guy. It was in his trailer with an audio guy and the video guy interviewing him he was the villain in the movie and and all of a sudden that this is a charlotte moment the trailer started shaking really hard now we're in pittsburgh but i'm so Mm -hmm. on edge that i leapt up out of my seat i like knocked the tripod over and i yelled earthquake (laughs) and everyone's jaws dropped and i turned and looked over my shoulder as the door to the trailer was open and Powers' uh, publicist was getting in the trailer and she was a big gal, like oh, no. <laughs> 350 maybe, close to 400 pounds, and she made the trailer shake like that. Oh, my and there's God. nothing you can say. I mean, there is no recovery from that by accusing someone of being as big as an earthquake. I mean, yeah. oh, my God. Just, I never worked for HBO again. Oh, well, that I just my heart goes out to you for that, for that happening. Uh, it was for my so ancient. <laughs> well, it was, you know, and yeah, you were on edge, and we all were because I was there for the Northridge quake as well. And for a few months after, every little bang or noise, yeah. leaping up like, look, where's the exit? So I totally, totally empathize. But that is a wonderful <laughs> Charlotte moment. It's got to show up in one of your books in the future. Again, for my listeners tonight, my guest is. This evening has been Pam Furterbar. And Pam, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. It was so great to hear from you and to hear about your book. And I wish you so much success with it. And the name of the book, again, is Feng Shui and Charlotte Nightingale. And you can find the book now. It's, out on, it's been released. And you can find it on Amazon. And also go to Pam's website, which is P A M S E R D E R. B-A-R dot com. Pam, thank you so much. Briar, thank you so much for having me. This has been a gas. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Good luck to you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>